everybody. Hello, this is John here. This is Paul. George. And Ringo. And we're very happy to be on your program once again. Hello, everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, and welcome to another Beatles News Briefs. And I'm here with Candy Leonard, author of Beatleness. Hello, Candy. Hey, Steve. How are you doing? Oh, don't ask. It's been a <laughs> it's been a rough week. Uh, if my voice sounds a little raspy, it's because I've been hit with a pretty bad cold. I'm actually coming out of it now, but uh, it's been that's not been a fun week. But in any event, um, there's nothing more important than your health, because if you don't feel healthy, everything else is more difficult. That's right. And it's also fun to to sit here and talk about the Beatles, which. Well, there's nothing more fun than that, as we know, as we know. And this is part of my part of my recuperation to talk about the Beatles. Actually, we we, we talked about doing this. Um, before George Harrison's birthday, and we had to kind of postpone it because of me. But we're gonna we're gonna do a little tribute to George and talk about George, and then we're gonna do a list of three songs that are special to each of us. But let's just talk about George. Uh, I think both of us. I think I can say pretty, you know, uh, without uh, being wrong, that both of us. Are, are have a very special place in our hearts for George. Um, yes, I, and I have to say, this is. Have you always been a George person? Because it is. This is my final destination. You know, what I'm saying? You know I, I don't. I don't think so. I think probably when when I saw them on Ed Sullivan, it wasn't George. But I I kind of evolved into George. Uh, George is the man, you know, you know, I mean, mean, on so many levels, you know, like this whole business about him being the quiet one, you know, it's like in his own way, he made a lot of noise, you know, in his own quiet way. Right. uh, You know, this other thing, too, is, you know, Paul's the cute one. George Harrison is a really, really handsome man. I'm not. And, I'm not. I don't. I'm not going there. I'm not commenting there. But. Of course, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fine. But, don't get but, me started on 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 you know male beetle commentators who refuse to acknowledge how beautiful they are. So we won't go there. But anyway. So yeah, George. I mean, he's beautiful inside and outside. You know, and and it, it's interesting. Tonight, I was cleaning through some files, and I found. Um, some of my concert and like sort of 70s memorabilia. And I found this um, picture, I think it was from Cream Magazine. It was an I, ad- I, saw that. I saw you posted that. Yeah, I posted it. It was from Cream Magazine and it was on my wall. So that would have been 1970. Mid-70s, mid, mid yeah. I, yeah. I, loved, I, I loved think Cream. it was probably an interview when All Things Must Pass came out is probably mm-hmm. what it was. So... You know, what was that, 70, 70, no, 71? When did that come out, 71? Well, I was thinking Cream was more mid-70s, but go ahead. But it, hey, it, but that's it, when George right. Stone had that long, I mean, it was just a, I remember I had it, you know, so so it's, it's funny because thinking back, oh, in high school, I would have said, oh, I was Paul, you know, but there was something about George that I was always drawn to. And just, you know, same thing with Lennon, like, you, you know, like at some point it was like, oh, I'm a John person. But there was always something about George, you know, and, and even, you know, in my, when, in my um, you know, early teens, you know, it was all about Paul because he was so cute, you know. But, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, well, he, you know, like as we grew up, you know, as they, you know, like we grew up and they evolved and it was just this, it was just an amazing thing. Anyway, I don't want to monopolize this, but, um, yeah, so I, I've really come to realize in the past couple of years that I've sort of come full circle and. Um, there's something, you know, he brought something just extraordinary, extraordinary. Well, we, I mean, they did. I mean, they all did. Right. We heard his, we heard his, we heard his guitar work early on, you know, and, and we heard, uh, don't bother me on the, you know, uh, on the meet the Beatles. And we heard him on the Ed Sullivan show and we heard his humor in, in a hard day's night, but. You know, it I don't think just, you know, he had this 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 uh, just this style, this savviness about him mm-hmm. and his, the grumpiness and how it just sort of all worked with this, you know, and then the whole spiritual dimension. I mean, it was just he you know, he, he had a really rough time, you know. I mean, just imagine having to, you know, be in between those huge egos 
And he somehow managed to thrive in that environment, which really speaks well of him. Right. You know, it, it, yeah, it wasn't until, you know, that songwriting evolved later, you know, that we saw, you know, what a treasure he was. And it just continued, you know, once he was a solo artist and, you know, we we lost him just way too soon, unfortunately. Yeah, it's really sad, you know. Um yeah, no, he he uh, he's extraordinary. I mean, I, you know, as time goes by, and I look at the Beatles as a whole, you know, the music, the experience, the you know, the phenomenon aspect of them. You know, George continues to um, emerge in you know more you know dis, you know definitive ways. I would say, in, right. in I think what they accomplished and what you know their well maybe accomplish is the wrong word but the the uh changes they brought into uh western culture you know i would take it that far well the spiritualism that george you know that that george uh brought um you know still lives on today i mean you have people meditating meditating and Right. Uh, mindful. And I'm happy to say that he is given credit for this in history books. You know, this piece I was working on a few months ago, you know, looking at how they were discussed and, and things. And, um, you know, George does get a lot of credit for introducing, um, you know, the whole meditation thing. And, and also and also Indian music, which. Indian music. And yeah. he also thing too is that I don't, do you know Michael Pollan the uh, guy who wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma and um, Food Rules he just did a book on the history of research in LSD and hallucinogenics and you know everything that the Beatles and Timothy Leary said about these drugs in the 1967 is being proven every day in, in major research universities across the country you know really? that that in certain controlled ways, this can be a, a, a um, cure, you know, a, a treat and treatment for depression, mm. uh, schizophrenia. In other words, they're finding all you know, because you know there's a whole history of research into this, and then it stopped. You know, the CIA was involved in it. It's a, quite a long history, and then it stopped in the '60s because it was becoming recreational. They made it illegal, but you know, there's always been this kind of underground research, but it's resurfaced and. You know, I don't want to get too far afield here, but the point I was making is that the <laughs> – stop me if you've heard this one. No, but that the Beatles were so on to these things, you know. Mm-hmm. They, 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 were, they had a wisdom about them, you know. And I think a lot of that kind of wisdom, that other way of knowing, you know, came from George. I mean, a little bit from John, but John, I think, more was the intellectual, you know. Right, right. And getting getting back to – um, Ravi Shankar. I mean, that music is is just so beautiful to listen to, and it's very you know it has its own calming effect. Oh, I love it. I mean, within you, without you, you know, that's a song. I'm not exaggerating. I I won't say I hear that song every day, but I probably hear that song several times a week. Mm-hmm. I'm not exaggerating, and I don't get tired of it. Well, I, I mean, I, I, again, talking about Ravi Shankar, I'm it, listening. I've become a fan of Ravi Shankar's, and I was lucky to, I actually got to meet him. He oh, played, wow. he played at my junior college, um, right around that, right around that time, uh, you know. Um, and uh, he and Al Araka came and and did this long. And I remember because I went to the show. It was a very long show. They started. I don't know. Remember what time? But they played for several hours I, at least three hours and, not, and it was just them and of course as he if you remember the movie monterey pop yeah the way they played there they ended with a with kind of a flourish and they did the same thing i remember him them do, doing the same thing at the show i saw and i of course in those days there wasn't the kind of security there was now right. so i got to we I went outside. I think I went out with a friend of mine, and we both met him and and talked to both him and Al Araka very short, you know, for a very short time. And they were both very very nice, extremely nice. But and I and I remember thank, telling him, you know, thank thanking him uh, for you know what he had done with George, and uh, yes. and he was just very humble about it. So 
yeah, he, um, you know, he probably didn't expect all that ever to happen. Well, and and and, and too, what was I mean? He always kept the music very sacred. He did it at Monterey, where he told yeah, he didn't like the hippies so much. He told them not to smoke, and he did the same thing at the concert for George, which is really kind of a you know that was kind of well, kind that's of, his credo, you know, like right. that's yeah, no, it's so, very interesting. So, so, um, so tonight we were going to talk about, um, how would you describe it? Our three most, our three, th- three songs that are special to us in some way. Was that what it was? Right. That's, that's what, that's what we were going to do. And we really, we really kind of made this kind of a loose category. It's, these aren't necessarily our favorites, but they're ones that are special to us. And, and, um, you know, and I, it, it was fun picking out three. I mean, it, it, we were talking before, uh, you know, we got started uh, about And Your Bird Can Sing, which is one I did not pick and one that I really liked. But um, there were just... That is one special tune. It is, it is. But anyway, um, go ahead and go ahead and let's hear the three that you picked. Okay. And talk about them. I'll try to be somewhat succinct. So speaking of my man, George, you know, I have to say, Think for Yourself is just up there for me. Okay. Um, I, fi- I mean, just sonically, that bass, I mean, just everything about it, his voice, the, the, the attitude, the words, the sound. And there's a, you know, if you, you know, like I had, you know, in Beatleness, when I asked people about that song, there's a guy who was 15 at the time. Mm-hmm. And he mm-hmm. liked that song because he like it was George telling somebody off, you know, and he would like to be able to tell somebody off that way someday, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a 15 year old. And then there was a, a girl um, younger, a nine year old who remembers hearing that song and wondered what opaque and rectifying meant. <laughs> now, that is just amazing you mm-hmm. know i mean how amazing is that so you see what they're opening up to people you know in so many on so many different levels it, it, and, rem- it, remi- it reminds me of um uh, brian wilson with surf's up columnated ruins domino <laughs> which is one of my favorite phrases um in in rock lyrics but what is it, the line col- columnated ruins domino i don't get i'm not getting this well no that i mean we're talking brian wilson and we're okay. talking we're talking surf you have to you have to hear the song okay but yeah i mean we're talking if you're talking lyrical genius that's another one that that right. knocks me it knocks me over but in any event yeah but, but yeah, so think great... for yourself you know like you know if you parse you know like we, we come to the, here's the thing with Beatles songs we come to them with the what would now be called the heteronormative mindset, okay? There's songs about, you know, male-female relationships. Okay, now whether they are or not almost doesn't matter. It's like what we hear as listeners, okay? So, you know, we come to this with the expectation that it's kind of a relationship song. As that 15-year-old, you know, that was his take. But um, yet, if you don't look too closely, I mean, for, like, you know, I don't, I sometimes I don't hear that part, but the, the there's a, the overall... You know, I don't parse the lyrics. It's like the takeaway, right? And the takeaway to me is extremely empowering. It's very direct. It's very, um, there's a wisdom in it. I hear some kind of wisdom in it that, um, and plus the sound of it, you know, there's something exciting about it, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, All right, so I'll stop. I'll move on now. Okay, so the other ones that you know i mean in addition to being you know a fan obviously you know i study this stuff and and you know as people know one of my interests is gender and how it relates to pop culture and the beatles in particular so there are two songs that i want to mention kind of through that lens okay and those are um the night before that's not a george is that that's no we're off george we're off george oh okay why, am I not allowed? To, can I be? Hey, he got the number one. He got the number one. He got the first one I mentioned. 
Okay. I mean, but again, it's special in different ways. So, okay. for example, within you without you, again, it's like it's sustenance. You know, it's like yeah. my vitamin D. I sort of take it, have to take it every day. But again, th this is the beauty of asking what's special about it versus what's your favorite, or you know, because okay. we have. I think we have different categories of that. I don't know, but but I think I just want to throw this out as something that I I find interesting in these like they're special to me because they resonate in this way okay. I would say okay and and that is um, the night before okay. which you know is a um, a man you know lamenting this kind of you know relationship that kind of you know vanished you know and and so you know it, it's sort of like the male version of will you still love me tomorrow right. Okay. And so that's a very vulnerable, man, you know, a position for a man to take. So there was, I think there was something very appealing about that okay. at the time, you know. And it was a different kind of uh, guy, you know, th than was presented to us in pop music before that. So it was kind of, you know, a new template. Um, and this theme of, you know, the night before, you know, the... Um, comes up again in Rubber Soul, where this notion of love disappearing overnight, like that kind of, that whole sort of the, the um, what's the word, ephemeralness, the whatever of love, you know, that, that's a Paul thing, like that comes up here and there. Okay. Um, so the night before is kind of interesting. Okay, so it, it's, it's this man wondering, will you still love me tomorrow? Okay, so then you juxtapose that on the same record with, you're gonna lose that girl. Okay. Which is a whole other kind of um, male, you know, all these, again, it's this sort of this, you know, we come to this, this heteronormative thing. Okay, like, what are they saying about male-female relationships? Okay, so you're going to lose that girl. So it's a guy giving advice to a friend, you know, like, mm -hmm. here's what you need to do if you want to make this girl happy. And here's what I would do. And if you don't do this, you're going to lose her. And so... What's interesting about this is that it's kind of advocating, you know, it's kind of very, I won't say feminist, but, it, it you know, it, it takes the woman's point of view into account, which is that in itself was a novelty, <laughs> you know, but the way you have this conversation between two men about how to treat a woman, but in a, but not, but with zero macho, see, that was the thing about them. There was zero macho. So, and that's why I think their music was very the, the words were, were, were very aspirational about what male-female relationships could be, I think, okay. in many ways. Um, so you're going to lose that. So, but, but here's the thing. So it's advocating for this woman, but in kind of a sexist way, because she has no agency in this. It's like, okay, you're going to lose. You know, it, it's sort of like, I don't know. It, it's, it, it, it's not totally benign i don't think but it's very it, it was different and it was better than a lot of the pop music that was around and um it, it, i think that there were a lot of latent messages about you know the you know how relationships could be more authentic and real um that unfortunately didn't get realized in the real world so those so you know as again as a sociologist and, and then just in gender and the Beatles, that's those two songs are special to me in that way. So I will shut up now and let you speak. Okay. Unless I'm you want to comment on I, anything I said. Well, I, I was surprised actually you didn't um on the on that male female thing. I'm surprised you didn't pick either my I'm looking through you or you won't see me. Well, yes, those I absolutely well, I was limited to three. Right. But I mean, I think I. Yeah, but love has a nasty habit of disappearing overnight. I mean, how many, how many um, mopey teenagers were um, assuaged by that, right? Okay. Okay. You think? <clears throat> probably. Probably. I mean, but yeah, back then when these songs came out, you know, they were looked at a lot differently, and they were probably they probably you know we probably. I, I mean, I didn't. But I mean, there were probably people that, you know, sat and, and you know, thought about these lyrics a lot more, you know, well, than we I don't did. Think, I don't think it's necessarily sitting and thinking about them. I think that they, it, it kind of just, you know, it, it's osmosis. I mean, I think some people are more cognizant of lyrics than others, and supposedly women are more so than men. But I think that the lyrics make a difference because you know, they were role models, and so, so certainly by the time of help, which is what we're talking about, and, 
you know, the, what they did mattered, you know, what they said mattered by that point. It's funny because I was thinking about this and I often, you know, in the book and when I give talks, I talk about how sort of the serious listening, you know, the close listening began with Rubber Soul because these songs were no longer Boy Meets Girl, but it was more like, you know, men, you know, man meets woman. And they were more sophisticated in that way. But I think that really started with help in a way, mm. um, you know, where you get this kind of, it's way more complicated than, you know, she loves. Her. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there's no there's no question about that. Yeah. Well, I think that this okay. was part of their gift to us is to like lay this all out, you know, in these various mm -hmm. ways. OK, um, I did it a little differently. Number one, my three songs are all basically are George related. In fact, two of them are George solo songs. OK, um, but. Um, I'll I'll start with the Beatles song. The Beatles song I picked was Taxman. Okay. And the reason I picked Taxman is because Ta Taxman was really probably, and I think I can say this pretty with pretty pretty much certainty that it was the first political move by the Beatles. Um, I well, I would disagree, but I won't interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Which one do you think is is which one would you say is was uh, earlier than that? The first political. political song, you know, I go back and forth on this. It's at least Nowhere Man, and it may go back to Rubber Soul. It may be The Word. It may be Think for Yourself. I'm not sure, but I think it predates. I, I, I think Nowhere Man, I guess, would be the least controversial alternative to Taxman. I mean, Taxman is obviously overtly political, yes, but I think right. that, yeah, that, political that, consciousness I, and, you know, the, I, mean, I think just like special can mean different things. I think political can, you know, mean different kinds of things, too. I don't know. Yeah, no, no, Nowhere Man, no, no, he, he, there's a good argument there for Nowhere Man, but it's that's a real philosophical um thing i think and this is like i said this is overtly yes absolutely and yeah they're, they're talking about sort of the political system yeah for sure you drive if you drive a car i'll tax the street and i loved and one thing about george is that his lyrics were never predictable you know they would take sharp turns into unexpected places and you'd never you'd never you'd be surprised he'd surprise you yes yes like if if you drive a car, I'll tax the street. If you try to sit, I'll tax your seat. If you get too cold, I'll tax the heat. If you take a walk, I'll tax your feet. And he does that. And he didn't just that. I mean, he changed. He changed it all the way through the song. It's like wow, you know. I mean, yeah, that's he's a good lyricist. He's a, right. he, was, he, you know, and he be, and he continued to be. I mean, at every at any moment, he was a good lyricist for what he was doing. But he, you know, you, we saw him evolve. Well, we saw them all evolve. But there was right. a particular different sort of arc with him. Right. Right. Um, the second song actually is a kind of is really a personal 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 favorite and that's cheer down and and i've always thought that if i ever get to live out my fantasy playing in a band on a stage i want to be able to play this song i don't know the song cheer down oh you, I, you I told you i don't know the solo stuff okay well it's i not, should it's, but i you know it's I not, never claimed to be a solo Beatle fan. It's a, it's a, it's a, it, it was a single. When, yeah. what, what year, when, when did it, when did it come out? God, I don't remember now. I, I, don't I mean, know. I, I mean, I, I, you know, there is some solo George that I do like. I don't know that particular one. Well, the reason I like this one is because he plays a, a fantastic slide guitar solo. Oh, okay. And I, and part of my, when I when I used to play guitar, I don't play much. I haven't played it in a long time. Um, but when I used to play guitar, I played slide guitar. Oh, nice. and and I really you know on open t open tuning for those of you that are guitarists. Um, and I just loved the fa the way he played this. I mean, George always played slide guitar. Yeah, he was masterful on the guitar in every way. And and you know, obviously his friend Eric was pretty good too. But I think George played with more soul than Eric. Right, and he played he played a lot of slide guitar, but he he especially did it on this song, and for some odd reason, um, this the solo on this um, on this uh, song always makes me emotional. It's just so good, 
And it's just so, it, the whole song is fantastic. I, I love this song to death. Um, but the, the, the solo, um, and I can hear it in my head because I was listening to it a little, a little while ago, is just fantastic. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful song. Um, the lyrics, and the lyrics are typical George, again, where he, where he, he, uh, you know, he takes you to, uh, you know, un, uh, unexpected places. If your hair should fall, if your share should crash, you'll get e- by even without getting a rash. Mm. <laughs> so, I mean, George, George's humor strikes again, you know. Um, but anyway, and then the third song, the third song is partially because of the video and partially because of what it is, it's when we was fab. Oh yes, that's yeah. a good one. Yes, and I I was sitting watching the the video, and and Ringo of course is all over it, and Elton John is in it, and also the the long held belief that Paul is playing the walrus in it, and uh, it sure looks like him, and whoever it is is holding a left handed bass, and but it's a you know that's a great song and. I never understood why the long version never got certain. There was a long version that came out on a, I think it was a 12 inch single um, that was released in the UK. And the, the long version, it had some extended um, effects at the end. You know how they, how he goes off in the end with the psychedelic on the Mm -hmm. sing on the single. Well, it actually continues for like another minute and a half on the on the extended version and i always wondered why he didn't just release that you know in the in the beginning but he didn't so hmm. but anyway but those well, that's are a, that's a good one yep but those are my you're gonna have to check out excuse me you're gonna check have to check out cheer down now you so. saying c-h-e-e-r yes Oh, so it's like not cheer up, it's cheer down. I get yep. which which album is it on? It was a single. It's on YouTube. You can. So it was not on an album. It was just a single. It was on uh, the best. It was on the uh, best of Dark Horse. Okay. Yeah. I mean, okay. I will absolutely check it out. Um, what when you talk about when we was fab, of course, makes me think about um, one of my favorite but saddest Harrison songs, which is um all those years ago. Right. And I was I went between that and this one and I went with this one partially because it was a, a Beatles tribute, whereas all those years ago is a is a you know, his homage to John. Right. And it's so spot on and it's so beautiful and really, you know, he nails it in that song. Like he really it's a great homage to to John, I think. Do you think that all those years ago uh, beats out uh, Paul's tribute to John? Um, and, I, and my mind is going blank. I can't think of the title right it's now. It's sort of the ballad. My, if if you were here today. Here, here yeah, here today. Are you but, kidding me? No, I'm saying I'm asking. Is that a serious question? Yes. Are you kidding? The Harrison song is infinitely better. I think here today is kind of mediocre. I mean, I love the sentiment, of course, but it's not a great song. What's so beautiful about all those years ago is that it rocks. You know what I mean? It captures a certain spirit and it's uh, no. What what do you think? Um, I, since I really like, the album that that was that here today was on. I'm I'm tempted to say here today, but they're but they were they're both good. Um, I I honestly I think I'd probably have to tip it to here today. Okay, I won't hold it against you. <laughs> <laughs> and a quick bit of news coming on Record Store Day on April 13th is a single disc album, vinyl album, Imagine John Lennon rare studio mixes with ten tracks. Side A has Imagine Take Ten. Uh, Crippled Inside, take 6. Jealous Guy, take 29. It's So Hard, take 11. I Don't Want to Be a Soldier Mama, take 4. Give Me Some Truth, take 4. That's an extended take. All My Love, take 20. How Do You Sleep, take 11. How, take 40. And Oh Yoko, take 1. These are all mixes from the box set. 
There was some initial confusion because the Record Store Day website had it listed as two, but we've confirmed it officially as just one disc. That's uh, that's it for today. Candy, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Steve. Fun thank- as always. Fun as always. Or good night and have a pleasant tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I miss that. All show. right. All right, Candy. Thanks a lot. And we'll be back soon. Okay. Till then, this is Steve Marinucci and Candy Leonard saying, Be seeing you.